So, uh, uh, and I can, I, I, because I saw so much hypocrisy when I was a child, <clears throat> I never wanted to connect to a cult or a sect that always was, that had to put down everything else to support its position. So I, I just don't, I don't want to be that way. Because I saw what happened, and, you know, with my parents, and some really cool things happened. Out of this kind of, we're the best and all the rest are inferior. <coughs> but, in, but also, I mean, you've got so many options. I mean, it, it still has a very, you feel something in India that you don't feel in other countries. You know, like it, there is a respect for anyone religious by most people. And, uh, <clears throat> and it's such an ancient culture, but, but modern life tends to religion become political and, and wealthy and, and, and you, you know, you get caught up in power and wealth. That, that's dangerous. Because then the whole spiritual quality tends to be lost in promoting things and worldly things. But it's a, it's a problem of ignorance, you know, of, of each other. So it's, it's human ignorance, you know, and I'm not, you know, where, because, you know, like, like we, you know, the, the thinking mind always wants the best. And so, you know, the, the, it's a dualistic structure of this is better than that, this is the best, this is inferior. And, and, it, and so, and our system of logic and reasoning is based on this dualism, you know, which, which is about comparing one thing with another, different qualities, and which is bigger and smaller and so forth. And when we attach to that function as a way we experience life, then we can't help but feel inferior or superior in various ways. And if we're told, you know, our, our religion is superior to the rest, and your parents affirm that when you're a child, you don't start doubting your parents till you're, you know, 13, 14 years old. <laughs> you get your initial kind of conditioning in those early years, and, you know, about your nationality, race, gender, all the rest comes from that conditioning and based on ignorance, really. So, you know, it's a some of the conditioning is very good, some of it isn't. <clears throat> but then, you know, you know, why do people, are all these endless wars going on over political views or religious views? And uh, because, of, you know, they don't, they're, they're coming from a, an identity that somehow uh, Sunni, but, uh, Sunni Islam is better than uh, is the real Islam, and the what's the other Shia. one? <laughs> Shia. Shia. Shia Buddhism is the inferior, or lesser form, and, and then you know the logic is that you get rid of the fight against the lesser, and so you, you, know, you demonize it, and so. This is this is because we're attached to these conditions all the time, and we don't know it. We're just operating from positions that we've acquired. You know, because when you acquire all that, when you're an innocent child, you don't choose it. It becomes you know the way you're conditioned to think and react and feel. So <clears throat> this is where the like with uh, our practice here, you know, if you, it, it really takes you outside that conditioning 
by the emphasize of Jit Wong and Ti Mind, you know, so that you can then you can get perspective on on the, the conditions that you you have that you acquired even before you even you were just a uh, a little babe soaking up whatever is given to you, you know. Because like consciousness is empty, it just doesn't have any form. It doesn't it doesn't belong to any religion. It's a, you know, it's it's a natural phenomena. Phenomenon. It's not even a phenomenon. It's it's here and now, and it, it's what we're experiencing in the present moment. And then uh, then the conditioning takes place, and then we see see we experience life through these uh, conditions. And that's why, like in the second noble truth, is about letting go, which isn't uh, it's not destructive. It's just if you just let go of things, then you, just, you, you can recognize the pure pure conscious. And then that's unity, because we're all experiencing the same consciousness at this moment. I mean, it's not what your, the consciousness you're experiencing is exactly the same as mine. <laughs> and, <clears throat> but the conditions in it are different. And so if you can get people to recognize that, then the conditions aren't no longer the things that are we're operating from. You no, know, we can we see you know we we realize the Dhamma reality, ultimate reality, and we're no longer just bound into reactive behavior on a conditional level. Yeah. And that's really you know I think that's very wonderful because it it. Uh, you know, we have to live in this whirlpool of samsara all the time, in human form, and it just, you know, it doesn't, it just, you know, when I first started meditating, it seemed impossible mm-hmm. because of the effect of, of the sensory world, you know, around, surrounding me, and also my own conditioning, just my own personality and emotional habits and reactions to things just seem, you know, there's no way to get out of them or get beyond them. But uh, there is. (laughs) (laughs) Can you say that that consciousness was already there before we were born and is there after we... Yeah, it's... It's not contradict, contradicting to the Buddhist teaching. No, not at all. Because, mm-hmm. like in Buddhist teaching, uh, you know, people get confused because of the five khandhas. Uh, because consciousness is, uh, you know, in that sense, uh, conditioned. But, uh, but vinyana, the word vinyana is used in different contexts. And so they have. You know, the, some of it's used as the, you know, consciousness is also one of the immeasurables for jhana, you know, so you, you know, you have um, space consciousness, nothingness, and neither perception and non-perception. And, and so, you know, when, but consciousness, you know, as a condition, it's what the five kinds of is about sense consciousness, consciousness through senses, through the seeing, hear, uh, hearing, smelling, touching, touching, thinking, and all that. Sense consciousness. But sense consciousness is impermanent because it's shifting all the time, you know, from you see something and you hear something, you smell something, and so forth. But the, but the consciousness... Uh, Pure consciousness, and in, in the Dinga Nikaya, they have Vinyanang, Anidasanang, Anantang, Sapadokabang, which is a consciousness, eternal, deathless, uh, boundless, bright, splendid, and that kind of thing. And this, uh, this uh, uh, is a nature of consciousness. And consciousness is a, a 
you know, you can you can't form an image of consciousness, but you can recognize it. Like space in this room, you know, you, you don't need to form an image of space because it's right here and now. You're just noticing it, really. And what, if you want to form a some have some form to represent space, what would you do? <laughs> <laughs> It's around us all the time, inside us, outside us, and then consciousness the same. It has no boundary. It's not, uh, you know, not about birth and death anymore. But uh, and the fakanda that's used as a as a sens- sensory consciousness, because that's what we cling to, sensory consciousness, experiencing life through senses. Our reality is through sensory impressions and uh, through conditioning you know so then the mindfulness sati sampatanya is is uh, where we can actually recognize pure consciousness because then you're because like conditioned phenomena can't recognize other conditions you know, if you, you know, if your right hand doesn't can't can't recognize your left hand except through consciousness, and uh, consciousness is in, in the in the Western sense we see it as a mental thing, like a brain function. <coughs> but in Buddhism, it's much more. It's one of the immeasurables, and and then it's. Here and now, you're conscious here and now, and uh, you can't define it, but you can recognize. And if you let go of your own thinking process and and uh, emotional habits, when you let go of things, then you suddenly recognize consciousness. You're not like when the Buddha was enlightened; you didn't go unconscious. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, that's where he, you know, in the first sermon, he's saying that between the annihilation and the eternalism of, you know, because the thinking process conceives eternal, like, or annihilation, and the way Theravada formulations are said, it, if you just do it logically, intellectually, it takes you to annihilation. Because it's where a, a theistic religion takes you to eternalism, and then, then in the first sermon, you know, he makes it very clear: it's not either one or the other. Well, what could that be? And, and but and, and the thinking process, you know, when you you can only have one thought moment at a time. You can't think the oh, two words at the same moment. So you, you recognize that that you you know when you're attached to thinking and, and and analyzing and criticizing and using that function of your mind, you're you're always um, you know you're you're caught in this sequence, this movement of one thing to the next, uh, where intuitive awareness, pure consciousness. And intuitive awareness, anatta, nibbana, uh, all these words convey this. It's, it's a real thing. It's not not a. It's not a theoretical consciousness. In this way, is not theoretical. It's recognizable. Can you call that pure consciousness? Can you call it pure real self? Well, in 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 Vedanta, they call it the, the real self, but in Buddhism, they don't use those terms. But it, what it means is, like, the Buddha never tried to, like, the word self, you know, in English is usually about, I'm this person, this body. And, um, and you notice how the Buddha taught, it's, the, it's not talking about some ultimate reality. It's not, you know, when you start, you don't talk about ultimate reality. And start from there. You start from here and now, suffering, dukkha, the first noble truth. So, and that's 
something easy to recognize. It's not high. Like God is high, very high. And uh, and words like Nibbana, what is Nibbana? You know, it's beyond everything you, your thinking mind packs up. You can't imagine Nibbana. And then you're, you're, you've got to deal with... Uh, <coughs> Because we're, you know, most most of us start from feeling discontented, unhappy, resentful. We've got all kinds of fears and and greed and anger that you know that that haunt the consciousness all the time. And so the interesting the thing that the Buddha did was establish the first sermon on something ordinary, banal even. You know, it doesn't have to be like being crucified on a cross, which is really suffering, but I mean, <laughs> just feeling hungry. <laughs> so, it's, uh, and then, because I've asked this a lot in, in, in England, where people have these interfaith they have a strong interfaith movement in London, and I used to attend these meetings. And of course, they'd always uh, all the other religions were theistic ones, and so they didn't quite know how to relate to Buddhism. They said it's not really religion; it's a kind of humanistic philosophy and whatnot. Well, then it, but uh, you know, then I uh, realized that. It's approaching the same thing from a different level. Like, uh, from the here and now, suffering is easy to see. You know, so, and everybody suffers, whether you're wealthy or poor, male or female, it's the same. You know, whether it's ancient India or modern Thailand or London or whatever, it's, some people suffer and still experience suffering. And, and then you change from where we always to seek happiness because you know when you're suffering we want to be happy we want to feel secure we want to be loved we want to uh, have money and security and, and uh, respect and all these other things so you know we're even you know you find even people that have all these things are still suffering if they don't know Dhamma. So, uh, taking suffering as a noble truth, you know, the interface with the groups was asking, that's not, you don't have a God, you don't believe in God. And, and then Buddhists, you know, a lot of Buddhists, especially Asian Buddhists, they, we don't believe in God at all, no, we don't have any God. And so they make it sound, you know, like a denial form. But, but God is only a word. What does it mean, you know? And and the, like born again Christians seem to think that, do you believe in God? And you know, what do you mean by that? You know, they think God. We all should have the same belief as they do. What do they mean by that? And, and try when you challenge them, they don't know how to describe it. You know, God, God. I can't just repeat the word. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can. Believe or disbelieve in God, you know we we can you know some of us some people believe and some people don't believe and some people are not sure don't really know they're kind of you know doubting types but uh, what you can know is there a God is I don't know or I believe, or I don't believe, or I'm not sure. Because these are mental states you're experiencing. You know, that who might have proclaimed there's a God, or there is a, you know. <laughs> I mean, I'm a product of this society, you know, and, and like American society, and, and, and so I, you know, I have a certain condition uh, view that there is, but then I, when I became a teenager, I disbelieved it. So I mean, this is very uncertain: believing or denying, disbelieving. Uh, 
But instead of that, the Buddha wasn't saying there isn't any God, or or you know, wasn't making proclamations of that nature. But he said there is suffering. Well, that's something we can all relate to. And then you, then you can, uh, and then the then the attitude is to understand suffering rather than just react to it, like trying to get rid of it or run away or just indulge in it and be miserable you, you understand means you have to open to it rather than try to get rid of it and that's like that sequence of the three aspects of each noble truth is the bodhipatha is, is the statement that there is suffering it should be understood is the bodhipatha and it, then the bodhiweight side is it you know, you reflect, and then you know you've, uh, you've accepted suffering in a way that you're not just reacting to it, trying to get rid of it or indulge in it. And that's a quite an important shift in, in uh, human, uh, human consciousness. Because, you know, the world is about seeking happiness and security. And, uh, and in a world of conditioned phenomena that we don't have that much control over. So, you know, we're trying to, you know, in Holland they're always trying to make everything secure all the dikes in one Because <laughs> <laughs> nature there can be right, quite challenging. And, and now they're having these terrible storms and, and uh, <laughs> weather, strange weather, and in, in North America, we're having this freezing temperatures in New York and Chicago. And so, this is, you know, this frightens us because we can't control it. We try to, you know. But this realm is a realm of change, inexorable changing. And so, this is what the Buddha was pointing at. This Kadish Buddha is always changing. That's his nature. You can't paralyze any condition and keep it. It's going to change. And uh, and something that arises is going to cease. So what you're attached to in now, you're going to lose. You know, even if, no matter how hard you try to hold on to it. Now if you change your attitude out and contemplate suffering and its causes like the the second noble truth about the uh, avijja, you know, the three desires and attachment to the three desires because this is a desire realm it, you know, what we see here, smell, taste, touch, think this feeling realm is all about pleasure, pain, beautiful, ugly it's, um, and, and we want the beautiful, the comfort, the, be the happiness we don't want the ugly, the painful, the misery of life. And so we have, you know, we want the sense pleasures, you know, good food and beautiful fragrances and sounds and stay forever young and beautiful and, <laughs> and on the sense level, <coughs> Yamadana, Pavadana is a desire to become something else, you know, what you what you'd like to become, like an enlightened Buddha or a Devada or a god or just a happy, secure human being. That's Bhavadana wanting something you don't have. And then uh Bhavadana is the desire to get rid of what you don't like. So you're trying to get rid of anger trying to get rid of greed, trying to get rid of sexual desire, trying to get rid of worry and anxiety and fear. I mean, with psychotherapists, uh, you know, that's what they do, try to help people to, you know, have more positive images of themselves and, and do things that make you happy, rather than actually looking at suffering as as the, as the first noble truth, the cause of suffering, and then the 
to, to see the, the desires, you're not getting rid of desire. You can't get rid of it. You can recognize, you know, you study desire in the, through these different three categories. That which is aware of desire is not desire. That which is aware of dukkha is not dukkha, and that's consciousness. Can you call it consciousness? Or can you call it your? I already asked. Can you call it your true self or your true being? Is it is it correct or? What? To call that that consciousness to call it your your real being or your real self? You can. I mean, you can do that. Yes. But then it, it tends to like uh, pronouns, possessive pronouns, to make it. It's easy to delude ourselves. And if you notice the way you, you, uh, you know, the, the structure, especially in Theravada Buddhism, it's structured so that it gives you least chance of hanging on to something. <laughs> but it sounds like annihilationism or nihilism. Like, like when somebody asked me years ago, uh, you know about Nibbana and this is when I first when I was at some there and I asked the monk up in Long Thai about Nibbana said it's extinction you just become extinct and that sounded rather awful actually <laughs> 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 uh, it sounded like annihilation to my mind you know and uh, but, and then Nibbana is a word you know that that is, a, it's a mystery word. What does it actually mean? And uh, but it doesn't give you any chance of clinging to it as some kind of ultimate form that you're. We can still say, "I want to reach nibbana and operate from that principle," but you won't get very far with that. It's when you let go that you realize nibbana. And nibbana is a reality, not a, not some kind of precious. Uh, attainment, but it's uh, the reality of now, and and so and anatta, or uh, um, you know these words uh, uh, like uh, unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. So I did. I always use that teaching in the same that Udana the Nibbana scriptures in, in Nudana and it I meditated let's see the Panta before this last Panta I used that as those, those four stanzas they, they're very you know it's just so beautifully said and, uh, and you know the first one is like almost like the heart sutra in Mahayana. It's it's uh, there's no sun, moon, earth, and on and on like this. Like in this, like in in consciousness, consciousness embraces the sun, the moon, the stars, all forms. You know, so, so your consciousness has no boundary. It it, it ha- it's immeasurable. I mean, I'm not trying to believe this, but it's, it's a way of looking at something. Just try it out, experiment with it. When you think of consciousness as this limited thing that comes and goes and flashes by, it doesn't seem, you know, you don't really know what it is. Uh, and, and what is it that can, can recognize conditioned phenomena? And then you, can one condition recognize another, or can desire no desire can uh, one desire no another desire you know that's, these are the kind of questions you ask yourself dunha and, but you can know dunha just by looking at you know wanting something you don't have or not wanting what you have is like this or Gamadana, you know, sexual desire, or or just pleasure-seeking sense pleasures, 
things that please your senses, you can recognize it. What is it that recognizes can know dhanha is not dhanha? And, and the conditioned realm is all about dhanha, it's about survival, it's about uh, birth and death. You know, so you're surrounded, your own body is, a, it is you know, dhanha creation human body, and then the senses are based on, you know, seeing seeing things that we want or don't want. But the knowing is beyond that, 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 uh, you know, it's not dhanha, but it is conscious. It's the knowing consciously that dhanha is a condition of rising, ceasing. So you end up with just a sense of, the Buddha made it incredibly simple for us because, it, you know, this this world we're living in, the, the conditioned realm, is so complicated. It goes on endlessly, like like the uh, metaphor of counting all the leaves in the forest here. You know, try to imagine yourself trying to count all the leaves. <laughs> and just one on a time, you know. And... Uh, you just couldn't keep track. It's too vast, and you're not, and we're too limited in our forms. We're not like God that sees overall from above, but we're human beings sitting right here, experiencing reality, you know, in, in limited forms, in a, in a place at this time. So, recognize that, that we're all under limitation in form, but not in consciousness. Is unlimited. I'm just saying this as a reflect, not asking you to believe it, but it, it changes <clears throat> the way, you know, your way of looking at things. 